Uh, next, we're going to have um, David Heisler. Is that your name? <laughs> Come on up. Come on up. <laughs> I am his. Um, what I love about David, not that he isn't brilliant and all There's that good stuff. You don't love about me. No. <laughs> well, the main <laughs> thing I love is your humor. And I'm trying to think, so if anybody knows a good line about laughter and humor, I want to put something on the wall of my new living room. I want to have it across there about, well, that would work. <laughs> Thank you, Elvis. And there's an Elvis spotting. <laughs> and it would bring forth a lot of questions, don't you imagine? Yeah, I could, that's good. That's what I want to do anyway. But David is from Lake Arrowhead, California, and he's married to lovely... Susan. Susan, I knew that. <laughs> she was here several years ago. We enjoyed having her. And um, he's an attorney. And he's right. Not in the usual sense, you understand. His, his love is um, defending fathers in custody suits because he had his own steps that way. So that's all I know about you. <laughs> Go to it. <coughs> this is a very serious topic. My wife says that I never listen to her. You know, I, I think that's what she said. <laughs> but uh, usually I make the coffee in the morning. And uh, just a few days ago I said I'm not doing it anymore. And she asked me why. And I said, well, I read the Bible. And it said Hebrews... I'm done. <laughs> Can I do one more joke or just get right into it? One more? Okay. All right. I'll tell you one more. And it, but it's a true story. Um, this summer I had the, the honor and the privilege of traveling with the missionaries, okay, with, with uh, John and Fred and Boyd, for a week. Then they sent me home. But, um, <laughs> but I was so honored. And, and, and so appreciative of, of uh, them allowing me to travel with them that when we drove through Los Angeles, this is a true story, we drove through Los Angeles, I took them to the Beverly Hills Hotel so Fred could use the restroom. True story. Because that is a true story. I said, I don't want to go here. I want to go to the gas station. I took them to the Beverly Hills. How many people have been in the Beverly Hills Hotel? They threw us out. <laughs> now, I, I, I have to say one thing. Eagles were there singing Hotel California. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my greatest fear is I'm going to fall off the back here. But anyway, um, no, no, okay. No, it's okay. I need to live on the edge. Um, I spent 30 years in, in doing public speaking uh, as a high school teacher for 10, a lawyer for 14, and I fit in some stage acting in the middle. And, um, and I have to say this, that it scares me to death to stand up and do this, okay? And why do I say that? The point is that every one of us is a teacher because a teacher is within. And when, when you got something, if you're scared to death, go with it and grab that microphone and teach the rest of us what you know, okay? That's the important thing. But don't think that, you know, that uh, I know Fred's scared to death and he gets up here and as natural as possible... But that's, you know, you have to do that. You have to just get past that. And uh, I want to say another thing. Um, this occurred to me the other day. We always talk about, you know, God showed me this. God showed me that. God gave me the revelation. And um, I, think, I think in my early days as being a believer, I thought that, um, that uh, if I could just get enough of this and that, you know. And, and the truth is, and what I've been coming down to is basic truth. Okay? And basic truth is God doesn't show you this and that. God shows you himself. And what you see is him. And that because, uh, uh, and that, and that kind of, you know, that's basic fundamental truth, which is the most important truth. Okay? And the rest of the stuff is, is, is maybe superfluous to that. Which reminds me, uh, the first time I heard uh, Norman speak, I was 19 years old, and... Um, 
and I, w- I w- went there with a seminary student friend of mine, Southwestern, uh, Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary. He was a student. I was a student at TCU. And um, we went uh, to hear the old missionary. And, and at the end, um, I'll tell you more about that later, but he had, there was two books out, and I wanted to buy one of the books. And it was The Deep Things of God and The Spontaneous You. And so my seminary student buddy, uh, he said, well, I'm going to get the deep things of God because I want to get into the deep stuff. And I thought, that's too deep for me. I'm going to get the surfacey stuff, <laughs> the spontaneous you. And, uh, but the reality is that the deep things of God are really not so deep. They're very, very simple, very, very simple. The deep things of God are, you could sum it up in about three sentences, which I have recently. God is love. Okay? He is for others. He is, he is us, lives his life as us, therefore we are for others. Our ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. Okay? And if that's as deep as you go in God, that's as deep as you need to go. Okay? Because that's a simple truth. There ain't not much more to it. And all truth is, is built on that. And if it doesn't pass that litmus test, okay, toss it out. Okay? Because that's the simple stuff. Okay? The name... Uh, I always give a title to what I do, and I always do it in the alternative. The title of what I'm doing is Christian Ethics, Morals, and Values. And and I was going to do a joke. Maybe I will. And since there is no such thing, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> or in the alternative, what I'm talking about is the temptation to do good. Okay, so we're talking about temptation, and I got a kind of a twist on it. And so I want to talk about that. Um, but I want to say that in, in, in terms of the simple approach, I take the Anna approach. Everybody knows who, Mr. who Anna is and Mr. God, this is Anna. Okay. She was, uh, if you don't, how many people know about Mr. God, this is Anna? Okay. Most of you do. You know, she was five years old when um, this come to me when this gentleman found her about 1935 on the streets of London. She lived to the ripe old age of eight. Okay. Um, but Anna had it right. And I'm going I'm to quote a couple things here. Um, uh, uh, when Anna was about five or six years old, the local parson said to Anna, um, Do you believe in God? Yes. Do you know what God is? He's God. Do you go to church? No. Why not? Because I know it all. And what do you know? Well, I know to love Mr. God and to love people and cats and dogs and birds and spiders and flowers and trees with all of me. Okay? Um, Talking about Anna, Finn, that's his name, Finn says, the idea of collective worship went against her idea of private conversations with Mr. God. As for going to church to to meet Mr. God, that was preposterous. If Mr. God wasn't everywhere, then he wasn't anywhere. Uh, for her, church going and Mr. Mr. God talks had no necessary connection. For her, the whole thing was transparently simple. You went to church to get the message when you were very young. Once you got it, you went out, you went out and did something about it. Okay, keeping on going to church because you hadn't got the message or didn't understand it, it was, was because either you hadn't got it or you didn't understand it, or it was just for swank, swank meaning to be stylish. Anna understood basic truth. Okay? Now, our topic is, uh, is temptation. And I really think that uh, it really doesn't matter what the topic is because there is only one topic, and that's Jesus. Okay? And whatever we talk about, um, it's, it's, it, it's, that's, he is the one we are talking about. Okay? Um, and now, what's, confusion, what's confusing about temptation? Uh, well, the, the idea... I think the standard way of thinking about temptation is that, uh, uh, and what is taught, is that it make me a better Christian, okay? It help me to grow or be a better person. And the true value of temptation, as probably anything we go through, is to ground you and settle you into who you are. And, uh, and temptation, like anything that would happen, is, is not about me. Okay? And that's the standard way of thinking of temptation. Temptation will always be, uh, ultimately, about, about others, about the, the life and love of God flowing through me to others. 
And uh, I, I think that the proper way to think of temptation is, is, is to think of the grounding and the settling into who you are and, and perhaps the choices that you have to make uh, regarding the reality of who you are. Now, um, I want to, I want to, I want to, I started that, but I want to give just a very brief overview so you know where I'm going. It's like you get in the airplane, and if you don't know where you're going to Philadelphia, you might be concerned, you know, once you go over Cincinnati, like, where are we going? Okay, so I'll tell you where, I'll tell you where Philadelphia is. Um, I, 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 I mentioned the confusing part of temptation, and, um, and the, uh, and, and the basic truth, uh, of the, uh, of everything we talk about, uh, and and the importance of grounding and settling who you are, as an expression of Jesus Christ in you, as you to your world, and um, um, uh, I I want to talk a little bit about um, basically how the church um, has got the whole thing backwards, and everything is about is about me and about my growth and about, you know, becoming who I am. And, and I think it all goes back to the Garden of Eden and it goes back to the tree uh, 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 of the knowledge of good and evil. And we're going to talk about that and the tree of life. And I think, every, and I think that we are, in fact, in the Garden. Um, and, and, what we, uh, and, and what we go through and the grounding and the settling is what it's all about, and and I and I want to talk about how uh, that produces faith uh, to see reality when appearance seems to be overwhelming, um, and you guys know about that, I think a lot in New Orleans about uh, reality uh, being being more real than appearance, um, and then I want to talk about uh, basically how Jesus. Uh, the temptation that he had, and I'm certain that he was tempted far more than we ever know about, okay? His temptation, the quality of his temptation was exactly like uh, the quality of our temptation, okay? Because I, I mentioned this last year when I talked about the Messianic prophecy, and I said Jesus was not born knowing that he was the Messiah. He had to read the verses, and, 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 I, think that, and I think that he had to be grounded and settled um, into who he was, and it came through temptation. And I think that we are grounded and settled into who we are through temptation. And, and I think that whatever he experienced, whatever Adam and Eve experienced, is also our experience. Okay, And I think it's all the same. And I want to try to pull that all together uh, if I can. Um, <clears throat> you asked me to give my testimony. I forgot to do it, so I'll do it later. Um, What's the flow of the universe? I kind of mentioned what it is. Um, the flow of the universe is always out. Okay? God is love. He, he is God for others. Universe being inside of God. Okay? The flow is always out. Okay? It's never back. All right? And so we, as, as his expression, the flow always goes through us. And, and, and the reason why I say that is because, again, tying it into temptation, whatever happens to you, remember, it's not about something happening here. It's about something happening here. It's about the flow going out. And, and a temptation, like everything, has got to operate based on the way God designed the universe to operate. And he designed it to operate based on himself. Okay, now, if, you know, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's really a tough to say that God... Uh, God made a choice because it's really it's it's human language trying to express something, but I, I go I suppose if he could have made a choice he, he would have had three choices, he could have been alone, or he could have made the creation to serve him, or he but in fact the choice if in fact he made a choice he made the creation to love and serve the creation and that's that's the flow of the universe. Um, and so then, and that's basic truth. Everything flows from the inside out. And, and so temptation, to understand it, has got to align itself with basic truth. Um, that, the, that, that the result of temptation, the ultimate result of temptation, will always be the life of God flowing through you. And that is true 
The, the universe operates uh, by God's design, regardless of appearance. Okay, and 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 uh, uh, appearances always seem to be to the opposite. Okay, uh, of reality. Um, and and appearances, you know, if you if you read the newspaper, you look at TV, appearance. Uh, if you if you went by appearance, it would look like the the world has gone to hell and always has been, and the devil's in control and so on and so forth. But that never uh, never confuse appearance with reality. Okay. Um, now temptation can be viewed negatively or positively. Okay. Again, uh, negative being appearance, positive being reality. Okay. So uh, so if you view temptation. Um, as by appearance, uh, by negative, uh, that would mean that it's about me. And 95% of, 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 of Christianity uh, view temptation as something that's about me, making me better, uh, 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 making me um, a better Christian, um, uh, be, or it might be because God is punishing me, so I'm, this, this is happening to me, um, and or you view temptation positively, uh, reality. This is not something that's happening to me except for the grounding and the settling part. But the ultimate, the ultimate truth is whatever the temptation is, it's, it's, it's about uh, the love of God flowing through me. And, and, you can, and you can think of, and if we just pause for a moment, you can think of anything that happens to you, I don't care what it is, okay, uh, where where the, you're tempted to do something, all right? And, and when you stop for a moment and you say, and you say, who am I? Who am I at this moment? And you become grounded and settled in the reality of that you are Jesus Christ this, at this moment. You're Jesus Christ. You are his expression at all times. But, but the, the moments of temptation are kind of like the spikes that happen, okay? Okay. Um, Now, human beings are, are, the, are the only part of creation um, that need their minds renewed, um, and, and Christians especially, uh, 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 to, to be able to see reality. Okay? And, and what I mean by that is uh, humans, and especially Christians, are, are the only ones who have a problem just being who they are. And if you think about it, all of creation just is what it is. Fish are fish. Birds are birds. You know, you know, the first bird in the formation is not turning around to the other one saying, now I want you to be better birds. Okay, I have this lesson for you. Okay, so you can be a better expression of bird. Okay, so love the other birds more so that they'll come to believe in Jesus like we do. Okay, you know, that, uh, you know the, all of creation just operates. If the trees are trees. You never see a tree saying, Huh, I'm, I think maybe I'm a stone. I don't know. You know but it's Christians who, who for the most part, have, they're the ones that need the mind renewing, and especially on this issue of temptation. Okay? Um, uh, 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 Christians view Christian growth okay, as, again, something happening to me. And we're going to talk about that more in a moment. Now, Christians, of course, have uh, an excuse uh, because, because who they are, and we're talking about who you are, who you are changed, right, at the moment of salvation. Who you are changed from being a container uh, of, of Satan to a container of God. So Christians do have an excuse as to why they're confused about who they are. And, and um, you know, sometimes... Sometimes the moment of salvation, you, you know, you know it. I know it. December 17th. I said that, and I, now I'm thinking it was it's December 16th, <laughs> 1971. I, but I know the moment, okay? And, and it's not important to know the moment. I do because it was traumatic. You know, I went from Judaism to Judaism. <laughs> Just like that. You know, and I, I, tell, I think I told you once that, you know, I try to make a point with, the very few times I ever talked to Norman, I tried to make a point with him. Well, I'm Jewish. And he said, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the point is, yes. Okay, so then we got into the conversation. Now, 
Let's talk about original temptation, okay, and original opportunity. There's a, there's a, there's a saying, which I paraphrase, that uh, I learned everything I needed to know in kindergarten, uh, right? Something like that. Well, kindergarten for us is Genesis 1, 2, 3. And, and in the first three chapters of Genesis, it's, it's pretty much everything you need to know. And, um, and uh, um, what, what is original temptation? Because original temptation is still our temptation. Okay? This is not, you know, what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden is not, just, not history. Okay? That is us. We are them right there. Okay? God had warned Adam that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that you would die. Okay, and he meant a spiritual death because he continued living after that. But Satan, in the, in the form of the serpent, the serpent said unto the woman, no jokes about that, uh, you shall surely, you shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan is a liar from day one. Okay, and that the first lie he ever told anybody is the same lie he tells today. He's on. You talk about someone on one note. Okay, he's a liar. He's a liar. Okay, so Satan said, knowing good and evil. This is this is so simple. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan promised if you knew good and evil, you would be like God. And that sounds good, doesn't it? Wow, I would like to be like God. Okay, uh, and that's the same, same temptation we get today. And, and, and the temptation, Satan wants everyone to think that temptation is just about doing evil. But look at what the name of the tree is, good and evil. That's why I say my, my talk is about the temptation to do good, because I want it to apply to us. But with temptation, uh, always come, with original, original temptation, you know, original sin, but there was also original opportunity. And, and that's where we fit in, because we avail ourselves of the opportunity. I assume that the opportunity that Adam and Eve could have availed themselves of were to say to Satan, you know, we are a branch of the tree of life. We are connected eternally to the tree of life. And we're an ex- we, we bear his fruit, and we're his expression. So we're really not interested in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay? And they missed that opportunity. And I'm not, you know, that's the way it is. And that's what God had planned. Um, but that is also our opportunity, okay? Because our temptation is exactly like Adam and Eve's, okay? Um, I think that when we experience tra- temptation, we are also standing in front of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and, and the real choice, uh, whether it's to be evil or whether it's to be good, the real choice is, is to be yourself, Okay? And, and that's the renewing of the mind and so on. But, but that, that presentation is always made. And to be yourself, obviously, is to be... Well, you already are yourself. That's not the point. This doesn't always know. Okay, so this is what's got to be renewed, to, to, to be the expression of who you are, which you are a, a branch of the tree of life. Um, and... Uh, I quote, We see the uniqueness of the gospel uh, is that when he who is self-giving love takes over a human life, uh, the one who has taken over himself becomes another lover. And not just uh, and not just blessed but a blesser. And not just healed but a healer. And not just loved but a lover. And you know who I'm quoting. Uh, That's Norman speaking. Um, Now, original temptation produced original religion. Okay, uh, I think that, uh, and this is how it really applies to us, okay, the, the temptation uh, uh, in Genesis chapter 3 given to Adam and Eve is the exact same, t- same temptation he has presented to the church for 2,000 years, okay? It, it, it is the call to live a life, remember what I'm talking about, Christian ethics, morals, and values. It was a call to live a religious life. Okay, if you know the difference between good and evil, this is what Satan said. If, 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 if that's where your mind is, okay, if your mind is about avoiding evil and doing good, okay, that's a call to the religious life. 
okay, that's that's a call to Christian ethics and morals and values, and that notion is 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 um, and and in other words, what Satan was calling Adam and Eve to do was to do good. Okay, I mean, how many people have thought about it in those terms? Okay, I mean, that when that struck me, the call of Satan was to an ethical life, a religious life, which which runs totally contrary to the way you think of temptation. And 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 I'm going to go over this in a second, but tem- but Satan is described in in Genesis 3:1 as the most subtle of of all the beasts of the field, of all the creation. And that's part of his subtlety. Okay? He he does not want us to think in terms of the call to do good. Because see that's always at good and evil is always at a, a much lower level than where we're at. The tree of life is the tallest tree in the garden. Okay? And when you're part of the tree of life and you climb to the top, okay, you're above all of it. Okay? You're above religion. You're above good and evil. Okay? It's, it's not even on your radar anymore. That's not how you live. It's not how you think of yourself. Okay? Um, but but uh, now how did I begin to think about think about this subject. Okay, I, I go to a non-denominational church. My wife is a member. My stepson is a member. I do not want to go to the new members class. I want to be able to attend the church for a while. Okay. <laughs> so they don't, I, I will have to speak if I go to the new members class. I'm not going to do that. But I like the music. I like being with my wife and my stepson there. So we go to the, Anyway, on, on every Wednesday, they have a guest speaker. Okay, and uh, this guy was going to speak for two Wednesdays, and he's a fireman, and he teaches uh, ethics, morals, and values to other firemen and policemen and other government workers. And so when he speaks to church groups, he, he changes into Christian ethics, morals, and values. You know, and you can imagine you know, what it was like sitting through this you know, for the first hour and a half. And at the end of the first Wednesday night meeting, okay, I went up to him privately, and I said, you know, I'm a lawyer. I have no ethics, morals, or values. <laughs> you know, and he did the same thing. He thought that was a joke. <laughs> and then I said, I corrected myself. I am a Christian, and I have no ethics, morals, or values. And he didn't think that part was funny. And then I corrected myself. I honed down what I said. I said, I have Jesus Christ living his life in me, as me. And I am not at all thinking about ethics, morals, and values. And and um, and I, I I we talked a little bit. And then I you know it it came to me like that. I said, What do you think Satan was doing with Adam and Eve in front of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He was doing exactly. And I was bold, you know. He's a little smaller than me, but I. <laughs> and I I'm a black belt, okay. And uh, and and so, but I got my dis- kept my distance because a fireman, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I said, I said, what do you, I said, what do you th- think about what you're saying? You you have a hundred, you know, whatever people here, captive audience, and you are and 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 this is Satan speaking. I know I, I don't think I said that exactly, but I said, what do you think? <laughs> I, <laughs> I said, what do you, you know, what do you think Satan was saying to Adam and Eve? Live a life of ethics, morals, and values. Do good. Avoid evil. It's so simple. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know, uh, Satan is, is so subtle. You know, if you ask someone about the two trees in the garden, they'll say, I mean, this is the most simple, the most basic story, right? And say, there were two trees? And if they remember one, they say, the tree of knowledge. You know, I mean, this is the most simple, basic stuff, um, and and that's that's religion, and um, and I, and I really began to think about, you know, how subtle Satan is, and and you know, we don't talk about him, and I don't like to talk about him, and I realize why, is because he gets more airtime in the church than Jesus does, okay, you know. You know, uh, he's uh, the Satan, the, the gnat of the universe. <laughs> the gnat of the universe. Little bug. Okay, but he's, he, you know, like Norman says, he's God's convenient agent. And, and so we need him doing this. 
We, we need him. We really do need him to bring us to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? So we can, we can reject it. Okay? So I'm not talking about good. I'm not talking about evil. I'm not talking about either. You know, I'm going to climb to the tallest tree, the tree of life, and that's where I live. Okay? And, and, and so the idea is that temptation, okay, is not a question of do I do what is good and evil in this circumstance. You know, and then Satan's got you, got you wrapped around a little finger at that moment. Okay? That's not it. I, you talk about, uh, you know, who am I at this moment? And it's a completely different discussion than good and evil. Who am I at this moment? Okay? Because, you know, Jesus, when he got out that whip, okay? And, I mean, you know, it's, it's like we were talking about this last night. You know, I talk about wine. And they said, well, you know, in the Old Testament, there was two kinds of wine. There was non-alcoholic and... But Jesus drank it. Yeah, but how about the whip? <laughs> it's not a real whip, okay, when he chased people out of the temple. Jesus was not thinking of, is this good or is this bad? Now, here's a, who am I and who I am? Is this my father's house and you get out of here? Take this junk with you. He was not thinking of good and evil. He was thinking of, who am I? Okay, that, you see, the, Satan has, he is so, the subtlety, the subtlety. You know, you th- Satan, he wears a red suit, he has horns and a tail and a pitchfork, and he wants the world to see him that way and, and getting people to do evil things, okay? And that's the subtlety, you know? Um, and we'll talk about Jesus in a moment, but he, I promise you he did not appear to Jesus in the wilderness, wherever he was, in a red suit. I guarantee he didn't do it. <laughs> he was far more subtle than that. Okay, now, um, yeah, had an image, was, okay, well, that's part of my point, that's part of my point, no, 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 uh, that's fine, but that, I think you have to think about that, because, I mean, the church is taught, you know, that, 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 you know, Satan was there, you know, Jesus, you know, and it was so clear to him. It wasn't, I don't believe it was clear at all. Would you agree with that, Fred? I don't think that he saw Satan, and I don't think he heard any words. You know, I think that Jesus was, I mean, at least physically speaking, was totally alone. Okay? And the subtlety, and we're going to get to this in a moment, the subtlety presented to Jesus, the same as our, the subtle lie being presented to us, was to do good. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay? To, that, that Satan wanted nothing more than Jesus to start a new religion. Okay, based on good and avoiding evil. Okay, anyway, uh, I quote again, uh, this trying to do good becomes a believer's cheap sin. In place of trying to do evil, the sin of the unbeliever, that's uh, Norman God Unlimited, page 106. Okay, um, the second thing I realized after, uh, after speaking, after how realizing how subtle Satan is, the second thing I realized after speaking to the firemen um, was that this message is what is preached and taught Sunday in, Sunday out, Wednesday in and Wednesday out, as often as they could get you there. Um, the, 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 the preaching of avoiding evil and doing good, and it's, it's a preaching of the, uh, of the um, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and uh, now, now here, here it is. Um, when, when a Christian's focus, when a believer's focus is on good and evil and religion, um, they, they lose their focus and their grounding and their settling into who they are. Um, and, uh, and, and I want to talk about, uh, John, first John talks about, I, I love when he talks about the children, young men, fathers. Okay? Uh, everyone starts off as a child. Okay? And the young man part, that's the part that always interests me, because how, how does he describe young men? Uh, he says, I write unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Okay? And 95% of the church, let's face it, are young men, young men and women. Okay? You are strong, the word of God abides in you, and you overcome the wicked one. Now, and people are very proud of that, but remember, that's all about me. Remember, temptation is not about me. Okay, nothing is about me. It's all about the flow, okay, because that's the way God designed the universe. 
but the, but, the, but the young man is all about me. I am strong. The word of God abides me. I have overcome the wicked one. And, I, and the point that I've gotten with that is that John, in writing that, never said that was good. All he said was that that's indicative of where you are. And he never said, and you need to stay there. Okay, because when fathers, okay, uh, fathers know him. And that's all you need to know. That's basic. Okay. Um, anyway, I went, um, I went back the next Wednesday because it was a two Wednesday night thing, thinking, you know, I made an inroad. And uh, I wasn't laughing. Okay. And I, I didn't. There was no inroad there. So I was going back to second Wednesday. Okay. Satan's Fall by Norman Grubb. Satan authored his fall not from being evil, but by trying to be God. And his influence on us trying to be God is by trying to be good. Now, um, uh, I, I don't, you know, I talk about young men, and I talk about where the church is at, and um, and I I don't uh, I don't blame anybody or or or, or talking um, uh, down about where anybody's at. Okay, the reality is everybody's at where God has them. Okay, that's the reality. So if 95% of the church is in the young man, okay, that's fine. That's where God has them. But, but life is full of the, uh, the paradox, okay? The paradox is I'm where I'm supposed to be too, and if that means that I go up to the young man and say, come on, you know, let's, uh, let's move on from here, that, that's fine too. Okay, so that's the paradox. Um, and, and, you know, you, you don't really know exactly, you know, why... God has revealed his son in you, you know, and, and, I, and I can't explain, you know, it's, it's grace. I can't explain, you know, why I had only been a believer for about 13 months. I was 19 years old when I heard Norman speak for the first time, and it took seven and a half years to get it. But I don't know, you know, why, you know, I, I, you know and I don't know why people spend 40 or 50 years as, in, in young man Christianity and all about me and standing at the tree of, of, of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, uh, but I, I do know that this is addressed ever, you know, I, you, you, you think about uh, uh, the church uh, for the most part and uh, ever learning and never, ever, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, now I say this, that the heir, as long as he is a child, and a young man's a child also, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Okay, and and uh, um, uh, the reality is, of course, that that every and I just want to touch on this briefly that every uh, uh, every believer is a father. Am I over my time? I'm getting it. The reality is, every believer is already a father, and and uh, I I I've, uh, I liken uh, every Christian at the moment at the moment of salvation. Like I said, you don't need. I know when mine happened. But, but you don't have to know when it happened. At that very moment, you are a father. You're an other lover. You're an intercessor. You're a father. Okay, and I, and uh, I liken it to um, uh, a fertilized egg, a human fertilized egg. Now, I checked with a doctor on this. Okay, and, and the doctor has assured me that the fertilized egg is 100%, at least genetically speaking, everything that they will ever be. And at the moment of Christian conception... You are everything you will ever be. You are a father. You will not improve. Okay? Well, then what is it? Well, n- you know. Okay? It's, it's the knowing. It's the seeing. Okay? Um, uh, it's God revealing his son in you. Okay? But you're already a father. And that's the reality. Um, so, what, so what is the Christian growth process? Okay? And through temptation or through whatever it is, it's the grounding and the fixing into who you are. I'm an expression of Jesus Christ. Uh, he, he lives his life in me, as me, through me. That's who I am. Um, I quote again, Just here lies the error of God's people and the deceit of Satan. He will always make it appear to us that there is still this old separation, the fruit of the fall. And that, of course, is... is uh, is um, uh, the young man stage. God is still away out there in heaven where we're here on earth, whereas the scripture says, even with regard to the risen and ascended Christ, we are raised and seated with him, in him in the heavenlies, even as he is in the earthlies, a spiritual union beyond adequate description by human language. 
Satan knows that if he can keep us in the delusion of separation, which is young man, um, looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as a, a call to a, an ethical life, a religious life, uh, we feel our, separ- feel our weakness, but won't bewail our ignorance, for, for we see our separate selves and know the limitations and corruptions, and the best we can do is attempt to, is to call on God, send help from above, and struggle to believe that he will. That's Norman, page 27 of Touching the Invisible. Um, now, I want to talk about Jesus becoming fixed into who he was by his temptation. Okay? And, I, and I've said the most subtle lie of Satan is a tempt- to the Christian is a temptation to do good, the call to religion, the call to the ethical life. Uh, if, if, uh, and, and I know that his temptation uh, and his temptations uh, were of the exact same quality as ours. Same thing. And I know that because though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Uh, and also, for we, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all point tempted as we are, yet without sin. Okay. Um, if, if uh, as I mentioned, you know, Jesus was not born fixed. He had to become fixed. And I think that that 40 days in, 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 in the wilderness uh, were probably the major part of the fixing. Um, and yet he, w- he was tempted to the, within 18 hours of his death, he was tempted, let this cup pass from me. He was tempted not to be in the program, not to be the Messiah that died on the cross. Okay, Up to the last 18 hours of his life, there were still those temptations happening. Um, but the, 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 now it, 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 the temptation, uh, I think the main temptation that Jesus got in the wilderness, which, like I said, no one was talking to him, although it is attributed to Satan, because it was, is that wouldn't it be a good idea to be an earthly king? Right in that, uh, showed him all the nations. Wouldn't it be a good idea? Good. Wouldn't it be good to be an earthly king? You would be a benevolent king, not unlike Caesar. You would have all these people have to do what you tell them to do. What a way to get the word out. Okay, you will all believe the way I tell you to believe. I'll be your king. The temptation to Jesus, the same temptation to us. Do something that's good. Okay, rather than we, we live totally above good and evil. Okay, um, and, and I think that as a human being, Jesus had to consider that. He had to think, I wonder if that might be a way to go. But then that was part of his grounding and fixing. No. Okay, which is which the same thing. This is not about what's good and what's evil. This is about who am I? I, you know, and, and Jesus' answer was, I am the Messiah. And, and I, 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 he read Psalm 22, and he knew what crucifixion was, and I had, to, I had to believe that he knew he would be crucified, that that was a death, okay? Because that's what Psalm 22 says. That's the death of the Messiah. Um, so, so he had to reject that and become more grounded and settled in the reality of who he was, an expression of the Father, one with the Father. Now, um, temptation develops faith. And, of course, it's not, not our faith. It's the faith of the Son of God. But um, uh, temptation, um, well, let me quote James. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And let patience have her perfect effect, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Because, you know, the, the way that verse is confused uh, is that, well, temptation is all about me, right? Okay? Because it says, James says, that you may be perfect and entire, working in nothing. Well, the, 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 the reality is, the basic truth is, we are already perfect and entire. And so whatever James has to say has got to square itself with basic truth. Okay? And since we are already perfect and entire then what is James talking about? He's not talking about my person. He may be talking about how I see my person, and he may be talking about my faith, but he's not talking about my person. Okay? And, and, and so, that, uh, that, so, so, so that is what temptation is. Um, and, and I don't care what the temptation is. You know, the tem- it, it, could, it could be something real easy. You know, you, 
you're someone who hits your car with their car, okay? They're clearly at fault, okay? And what, what's the temptation? You want to get out and you want to, you know, express yourself. Okay, well, whatever, okay? <laughs> okay, and of course, that's the temptation, okay? And developing faith, you see the reality, not the appearance. You see the positive, not the negative. Okay, the reality is that God has obviously lined up this circumstance so that the love of God and the life of, of Jesus can come through me at this moment, whatever it is. Okay, and and to be able to and the, and on the on the uh, on the appearance side, this looked like a bad thing that happened, but on the reality side, it's one more opportunity to be grounded and settled into who I am and to be Jesus at this moment, because that's who I am. And let that flow. And I don't, you name the temptation, okay? Whatever it is, okay? Whatever's in your mind, that's the opportunity. And I want to wrap up, so I'm going to do that. And and with that development of faith is is uh, where we become safe sons, like like Norman talked about, where where, where not only can be we we be trusted, but we can trust ourselves in that situation. And in conclusion, um, and I'll just read this. Happily for many, we come to the end of our rope with Christianity as a religion. In our understanding, we move on from young men. We turn from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and see that we are already a branch of the tree of life. We embrace the reality of our death on the cross. We affirm by faith Jesus is not only in us, but also lives through us as us. And becoming grounded and settled into fatherhood, we now know that we are intercessors and co-saviors and that ultimately temptation presented to us produced life and love for others. Thank you very much. David, I uh, just looked at my list, and one person who was coming up turned me down, and one never was asked. So could you give your testimony just a minute? We have time for you. 